Hello everyone, I am Ming Tiong Nong Kumar. I am a student from Tetsu College, Nagaland, and I am currently pursuing my Bachelor of Arts in History. Today's session is on the theme Women and Sustainability, and we couldn't find a more fitting and accomplished personality than our respected ma'am, uh, Jasmina Zilia. Uh, she is the founder owner of Heirloom Naga. Uh, King Concepts and many more. Uh, Matt, can you please tell a little more about yourself? Thank you, Uti. Uh, well, we already mentioned uh, Erlum Naga, which is a textiles oriented uh, business that I started almost uh, three decades ago. And uh, also King Concepts, which is primarily into uh, bamboo and cane products from Nagaland. Um, I also co-founded another uh, Northeast speciality store called Cognac in Guwahati, uh, which is to give a platform to all our artisans and weavers across Northeast India. And I also co-founded Razapu, it's a heritage homestay in Kohima. It's just a nine-room property. Uh, we felt that uh, you know uh, travelers needed something more organic and uh, you know, authentic to stay in and hence I started Razapu almost more than a decade back also. Uh, I am also a convener of Northeast India to the Export Promotion Council for Handicrafts. Uh, I am also an executive member in the Handicrafts and Carpet Sector Skill Council and recently I have been appointed as an advisor to the government of India, textiles, uh, the Ministry of Textiles, under the Handroom Recommendation Committee. Okay, ma'am. So, like, which are the countries that you export your products to? Um, well, um, I've lost track of the number of countries that we export to, but uh, currently my major markets are in US, uh, Japan, Australia, the UK. And Europe. Oh, and recently, of late, you know, we've also been uh, receiving a lot of new clients from uh, UAE and South Africa as well. And what are the main items that are exported? Uh, so, primarily, it's soft furnishings. When I say soft furnishings, it's uh, cushion covers in different sizes, cotton shows, table runners, and uh, uh, in hard goods, we export a lot of trays, bamboo baskets and wall decor items. And yes, it's also interesting to, uh, to tell you that you know, we also export a lot of uh, uh, curated one-of-a-kind uh, you know, uh, artifacts which are made by one of our clusters in, uh, in Nongwa village in Mon area. And do the clients like, provide you with their own personalized designs? Or do they require custom-made? Um, in our case, like you know, it's quite funny that uh, whatever designs that we uh, we develop and we showcase at the B two B fairs, those are the ones uh, which are which have always been picked up by the clients. Maybe some minor changes in by in terms of or in design inputs in terms of color preferences are advised, but by and large, uh, it's all in our in house designs which are selected. Um, I can see some products behind you. So, like, are these all? Uh, which one? This one. Okay. So this is one of the products that you know. Remember, I I spoke about uh, you know imparting training to a group of girls and women, or uh, you know, last year during the entire pandemic. So this is one of the bamboo mats that they have made, and you know, uh, this is inspired by the we know that every house in Northeast India has. So essentially, we've just uh, added color, and so this is a natural dye. Uh, and this this uh, diamond tape motif has been, you know, inspired by one of our traditional shawls. So this is uh, woven by the uh, by all the girls who will receive training from us, and this is done in house in my factory in, in Sobima village. And this particular piece is being, uh, you know, sold through many outlets in UK. So it's a you know it's a very long journey between within where it's made and where it's fine where it finally lands up. And when I say lands up, it lands up in very like swish luxury homes around the world. So 
this is one of them. Uh, this uh, this is something that you know we work with only women in Manipur. Yes, yeah, so this is a kind of reed uh, that is uh, specific to Manipur, and we give them our own design. So it's it's uh, for a dual purpose. It could be either a placemat or it could be it could go in as a wall decor item. And uh, uh, as you can see, um, these are the some of the products that we the whimsical called uh, you know Naga original products that we make uh, with our group of uh, artists, male artisans in the Konyan area. Your journey as a serial entrepreneur started nearly 30 years ago. Right. So, can you tell us a little more about the early days? Like, okay. what were the challenges and struggles that you faced? Okay. You said 30 years, suddenly you make me feel very vintage. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, having said that, uh, you know, almost since you mentioned 30, 30 years, okay, almost, let me put it more mildly by saying that almost three decades ago, you know, after a college education outside the state, I came home. And, uh, you know, as was expected of any of us back in the day, I love to say back in the day because, you know, we had very uh, limited uh, avenues for, uh, you know, employment or to be engaged in. So the most common route for many of us who came back home was to find a regular job. So, uh, you know, I was not an exception. I also went to the rigmarole of the entire process of trying to seek a regular or a, let's say formal nine to five job that didn't happen and thank god it didn't happen otherwise i wouldn't be where i am today so you know the the most common saying that when one door closes on you another door opens so i totally relate to that okay? so uh like i said I, after going through all the rigmarole of you know seeking a, a regular job one thing that uh, you know uh, spoke to me over and over again was that you know I uh, needed to do something on my own. You know, it it would be a total shame that you know uh, having you know studied outside the state, I am not utilizing any of my knowledge here in the state. So uh, not to be uh, not to keep still. I dabbled in many uh, small, small you know, businesses. Now we call it a startup, but uh, back in the day, all that jargon was not there. Okay, so you know, it was just an activity, or it was just a s small business that we started, that I started literally. But uh, again, you know, uh, unless you try, you never really know, you know, where your uh, strength lies. So after doing uh, like a series of small businesses, which course didn't work out, I uh, found my calling in the handmade sector. So when I say I found my calling, it was in a sector which, which you know, was already well known outside the state. So essentially it was uh, weaving, you know, textiles, and also, uh, you know, uh, handicrafts, which was very well known uh, outside the state when it came to Nagaland, the first thing that comes to mind is your, you know, your colorful textiles or your colorful crafts. But uh, at that time, you know, whatever was available in the state was only in a traditional format. So, you know, uh, it, uh, you know, set me thinking like, how about, you know, reimagining the existing traditional textiles or the existing crafts and uh, you know making them more, more meaningful or let's put it this way making them more relevant so this is truly how my entire journey started there was this one weaver who was uh, who lived below my house and every afternoon you know I would, or evening i would whenever i crossed her house i would see her weaving in her veranda so one day i went to her and i, I asked her you know how about you know using your loin loop and how about making some few samples. Okay, so that, you know, uh, completely opened my journey as an entrepreneur. It was not without, I mean, it was not, uh, you know, I didn't have a proper business plan, sorry to say that to, you know, students, but, you know, whatever I did was, began, uh, was in a very organic manner, I would say. But I think, uh, uh, 
you know, um, whatever I did at that time, you know, found instant favor outside the state. Because again, like I mentioned earlier, whatever was available was extremely traditional. It was either a traditional shawl or a mechla or you know, nothing beyond that. So by you know coming up with a line of soft furnishings in cotton, that that was an instant hit in the market. And trust me, ever since I haven't looked back. So very early, you know, in my conversation with you, I would say that you know you have to find your own niche in the market and fill in that gap in the market. So that's pretty much my initial journey. Thank you. So our team today, as mentioned earlier, is women and sustainability. So, as a successful woman entrepreneur, uh, your operations span mainly across four different verticals, which is tech textiles, home decor, traditional handcrafted jewelry, and hospitality sector. So, like, how important is sustainability to you? And do you implement sustainable processes and practices across all your business verticals? Um. I think sustainability is the buzzword today and I often think that it's badly misused. Many people don't understand the meaning of true sustainability. You've already mentioned that you know I have been around for 30 years. So you know the first thing that I will tell you is like I have managed to sustain my business. Okay, so which itself is a big thing for me. And having said that, you know, um, my biggest, my biggest challenge, which many people ask me, you haven't asked me yet, but let me <laughs> tell you that right away that my biggest challenge till from since inception has been to sustain the business. And, you know, uh, when I say sustain the business, many people will ask me about sustainable practices and so on and so forth. But for me, truthfully speaking, it's about you know, the biggest challenge was to sustain the business. And therein, like a bigger challenge, more of the bigger challenge was to, you know, sustain the artisans, and sustain all the people in the value chain that you have created, uh, to be able to provide them with uninterrupted work. So, till today, you know, uh, you know, there are times when we have gaps in our orders. So my, you know, I go to bed with a very heavy heart. <laughs> what am I, you know, what am I going to uh, make them weave next? What am I going to ask them to make for me next? You know, so that has been to sustain the business for me. Essentially, is like number one priority. Number two, yes, we use uh, ours is only about su sustainable practices. You see, when we talk about the the loom that we u utilize, well, that's the most archaic or if not most primitive loom known to mankind and uh, you know heirloom naga as a business has been uh, instrumental in spotlighting the practice of loin loom weaving not only in india but also globally so today we have very few communities indigenous communities uh, around the globe which practice loin loom weaving and uh, i think when I say spotlighting the region, we've uh, spotlighting the practice of loin loom weaving. We've been able to, you know, uh, retail and wholesale products woven on the loin loom. Okay, and when I say loin loom, like all the weavers work from within the confines of their own homes. This has been one of my major advantage and disadvantage. So by allowing them, the weavers, the freedom to work within the confines of the own rooms and at their own pace. It's all about, uh, you know, using the, the loom, which is, uh, which, which belongs to them and which, and the process of weaving is completely sustainable because here we don't have, we don't have any uh, carbon footprint to begin with. And, uh, and, and yes, like uh, I, totally relate to the fact that you know we bring women empowerment not only at the grassroots level but to their doorsteps you know how beautiful it is that you know a woman is like besides looking after uh, pandering to her other chores in the house she's also sitting in her comfort zone she's also making a living 
and in the process she's able to empower herself financially. Now I think women all over the world need to be empowered financially. Now this has been my biggest driving point till date and uh, like I said sustainability uh, is a buzzword these days. You think when you mention the word sustainable it sells but here, uh, people don't understand that, you know, whatever practices that we do that, and the, that goes into making any handmade product, that's completely sustainable. We do it, talk about the, uh, the process that goes into it, or even the material that we use, whether it's cotton or whether it's the wild silk that we use, whether it's bamboo, whether it's cane or any other, you know, natural fiber or grass that we use, these are all sustainable. Uh, materials that we use. So to answer your question, is 100% sustainable. So I have another question. Um, natural and handmade products uh, tend to be overshadowed by the synthetic, uh, mass-produced synthetic products. So how would you convince your customers to opt for sustainable products like yours? over the cheaper but unsustainable products which cause immeasurable damage to the environment. Yeah, so you know, uh, my journey as an entrepreneur has pretty much been about educating, you know, the well, uh, educating customers about this very factor. Um, it's only, I think, in the last five or six years, or let's put it like uh, one decade, that people have understood the importance of the handmade. And therefore, the handmade movement is a very strong movement, and uh, anywhere in India now, or even outside the country. But back in the day, again, I'm going back to back in the day. Okay, it wasn't so. You know, I had to. Uh, I was at the uh, receiving end of many condescending comments from customers, and whenever I used to go for a B two B fair, which was which is only, which is my only model of. Uh, business activity in any B2B fair, like, you know, you, you would have this content sending customers um, looking at our product, feeling it, and saying, How much? You know, that was a typical <laughs> question that would come. Not so much for, from the global customers, but from within the domestic market. And then, you know, as soon as they heard the price, the first thing they'll quit is, Why so expensive? So, you know, uh, it was pretty much left to me to sensitize the customers. And also to stand my ground in being able to say no. You know, when it, when I say condescending attitude, like there were customers who would, you know, literally be mocking at, you know, the prices at, at me when they heard my prices and said, okay, in China, I get this basket for, say, like 50 cents, like, why so expensive? I'll order 10,000 pieces. So I would look, look at them point blank and say that I cannot even make 10,000 pieces at this juncture for you. It is... Uh, it is not, uh, there is no uh, machines involved in, in the work that we do and at that time you know there were occasions when you know one was made to feel very inadequate but not now because you know people well evolved people or well evolved customers will all subscribe to handmade now okay the world is now moving towards uh, sustainable living and conscious consumption and in, therein, therein lies our USP, being able to, you know, provide a product which has been made uh, with a lot of sweat, uh, blood, sweat and tears. You know, there is a soul in any product that we offer to our customer. So, uh, so in that sense, you know, uh, uh, anything like made by hand is now um, much preferred by the customer over any synthetic or any like machine made product. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I think we are getting a lot of traction. I think that's the right word to use currently because uh, you know most of our, I mean 99% of the work that we do is sold only in overseas markets. So once like the, you know, our domestic customers see, see them at you know prime stores or luxury stores in several countries, naturally uh, you know. Uh, even in the domestic market, a lot of like well-heeled, well-evolved customers are reaching out to us now. But yes, I think uh, overseas markets have long understood the importance of the handmade. And therefore, they subscribe to whatever we make because they understand the processes, they understand 
how crucial it is for uh, any uh, you know any um, organization or any company or any business to uh, I won't say support but to subscribe to the handmade movement and in doing so ensure that you know uh, the continuity of the handmade is ensured and uh, not only that uh, in doing so ensuring that traditional practices around the world is preserved and uh, in doing so the cultural legacy of any community of all communities are preserved so that i think the overseas market or the western world has understood that long back so across all your businesses yes. a significant number of artisans weavers etc which are women uh, not only have you given them an opportunity to stand on their feet and do something significant, but you have also made them financially independent uh, and self-reliant. So today we talk about women empowerment. You were one of the pioneers when it came to empowering women and giving them a sense of direction and purpose in life. So was it a conscious decision of yours to empower so many women and bring about a drastic change in their lives? Yes. And, uh, you know, uh, you must understand where I'm coming from. You know, being a single parent for almost more than two decades, I have understood completely how crucial it is to empower women at, you know, at any given uh, level. So, uh, yes, I've made a very, very conscious effort to work with women across all, uh, you know, uh, verticals of my business. When it comes to textiles, it's a 100% women-oriented company. Uh, because of the one fact that, you know, weaving in Naga society is considered taboo by men. So, therefore, I work only with women. And I have made a conscious uh, decision to employ only women in my organization when it comes to textiles. And uh, in fact, uh, la last year, was it last year when the pandemic struck us, you know, you know, suddenly our textiles business saw a jump in our orders. And I made a conscious decision to bring in eight new uh, girls, you know, some at the inspection level, some at the production level, some in the admin level. So, the, so yes, it's I make a very conscious effort to rope in only women in my organization when it comes to the textiles uh, uh, business. Also, I'm making a very conscious effort now to uh, introduce handicrafts to women in Nagaland. You know, uh, in Nagaland, I think uh, the handmade sector is a very gendered thing. Women are like relegated to the text, uh, to the softer side of textiles, while men take up all the you know mantle for handicrafts. But today, you know, like there are a lot of uh, school dropouts or college dropouts, let's put it this way, who are not too interest keen on taking up the practice of loin room weaving because it does cause a lot of strain on their backs. So, and maybe uh, uh, they, uh, they consider it, uh, you know, uh, not a very uh, uh, evolved, uh, what to call that, not a very evolved uh, business for them to be engaged in. So, uh, you know, we organized a, a skill training program last year, just before the pandemic, for about 40 uh, girls. Most of them were school dropouts again, and I taught them how to, you know, weave bamboo mats. These mats, we use them to line up all our service trays, and all the, these service trays are, you know, wall decor items, and all these items are mostly for the export market. And uh, the beauty of why I, you know, why I am relating this to you is, is because the beauty is that after they were imparted the skill development training. For the first time ever in the lives, they caught on so fast because you know you have to understand that our girls and our boys are so super talented when it comes to working with their hands. When it comes to creativity, when it comes to working with hands, I think it's in their DNA. You know? 
So um, they picked up the craft so fast that, you know, immediately, like, I had received a lot of export orders on some of the bamboo trays and on some of the bamboo work before. And trust me, you know, like, it gave me such a sense of accomplishment because I was able to, you know, provide them the uninterrupted work throughout the pandemic. Throughout the pandemic, all those that the, my first batch of, uh, you know, uh, uh, weavers for the bamboo handicrafts, for the first time, were women and girls, and none of them like uh, was left without work. So, you know, this conscious effort to drive in more women into the gendered world of handicrafts in our society is also like um, you know beginning to show a lot of promise even today this morning before you came in uh, you know we have developed a very large cluster of women met or met weavers from Tuli and we 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 do uh, we do it very simply without any fuss we receive orders we just send them a whatsapp x number of pieces of bamboo mats this make and send pronto in the next 10 days or so it arrives by sumo and you know it's so easy to conduct business these days because you know you can immediately transfer the money that is due to them so in this uh, in this in this manner i am you know uh, trying to rope in as many women as possible into whatever business that I do so that you know they uh, can empower themselves and anybody who is empowered her voice is heard you know even in my hospitality business uh, whereby I have a uh, like a heritage home stay in Kohima Brazil uh, out of the ratio of my employees like the women who so, which among these do you consider as the most challenging venture of yours to date? It's Erlum Naga yeah. because of the number of uh, women that I work with and also because since uh, we are catering mostly to an overseas market and uh, you know in the overseas market and this, the, the clients that we work with are very high end so they expect a certain quality from us now, uh, I'm not saying that our weavers are not skilled. Everybody has their primary skills in weaving, but to you know, uh, uh, get them to conform to standards, number one, and to sizes. That's been a daunting uh, challenge, and it continues to be because, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the, the overseas clients, many of them are not very tolerant of the discrepancies that may occur due to weaving. To a certain extent, uh, a small degree margin of discrepancy is accepted. But beyond that, nobody is willing to, you know, listen to you that okay, like this is woven in uh, in the villages and you know by women and it's handmade. But no, you know, even if it's a handmade product, it has to be uh, a well woven product. So, um, so yes, so you know, uh, skilling. Uh, the the weavers in terms of sizes and standardization that is in heirloom naga has been and continues to be my biggest challenge to date and also to secure you know uh, continuous orders from our customers so that you know none of the you know weavers their looms are empty that's also a daunting challenge for me uh, how important is the role of the government and in situations uh, in supporting and mentoring entrepreneurs who, who come up with different entrepreneurial ideas or a different product line to cater to a particular market segment? Um, first of all, I think the government is a facilitator. The problem with us is that we have too much dependency on our governments, which is why the entrepreneurship um, uh, level has not reached the required uh, required standards in Nagaland at least. I think most of us we feel too uh, you know uh, entitled to all the government uh, support without helping themselves. But yes, the uh, government, since I mentioned, is a facilitator in terms of mentorship 
programs which are which are which are there for entrepreneurs to take up. I think that's important. And number two, I think it's important uh, to for governments to help you know entrepreneurs to scale up their businesses through their many welfare schemes or activities that they have. But I think too much dependency on the government is not going to help you in any way. I would like to conclude by asking if you have any advice for the young and budding entrepreneurs uh, who want to incubate successful startups and what is your mantra for success? I think first of all, any budding entrepreneur should find his or her own groove, right? Whatever they do, it has to be novel. They have to have original ideas. You know, the problem with us, I keep saying the problems because I have been observing that for too long. You know, we have this herd mentality in Nagaland. If uh, MT is started a jewelry business, you can be rest assured the rest of your neighborhood is also doing that. You know, during my time, there were a lot of us who who started textiles business and every woman had uh, was a handloom specialist. But I think over a period of time, the person who is original, who has original ideas and who finds his or her own niche or groove, they stand apart. Number, number one is find your own group. Number two, be original. Number three is to, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, to invest your energies into your business or into your business model. You know, I find that increasingly young startups or young entrepreneurs, young people basically, are investing too much of their time and resources on being politically correct on social media. I mean, like, I know personally know of pages on Instagram who may be doing just two and a half things, but their pages are incredibly like beautiful, and I'm not sure how much uh, you know their turnover is. So that energy which they spend on the digital media, which is also a good thing, but up to a point, should be invested in their business, I personally feel. Till today, if you ask me the truth, like we barely show like even 25% of what we do on Instagram or any other social media pages because of various reasons. But uh, having said that, I think the new uh, gen has had it too easy, you know, because of the digital highway. So. While, at the, while it has its pluses, it also has a lot of uh, you know, uh, uh, minuses when it comes to this because there's too much of thought process involved in looking good, you know, in feeling right and all that. So I think that energy needs to be spent into the business. But definitely, I think the one mantra that you ask me is to be original in whatever you do. Thank you so much for your valuable advice. Thank you. Uh, we thank everyone who has joined us for this session and I hope you all have a great learning experience like I have and stay tuned for more talk sessions. Stay safe. Everyone. Thank you.